We in Britain must fetch our oil from overseas. Nowadays, direct from the distant oil fields, the ocean tankers bring in crude oil. For oil refining has become a great new British industry. At the edge of Southampton Water, an immense jetty, alone handling 25% of Britain's oil imports, serves the largest of Britain's refineries. Some 50 tankers a month, delivering between them upwards of 6 million tonnes of crude oil a year, tie up here to discharge their cargoes. And now we begin to watch the cycle of events. From the delivery of the crude to the final emergence of the finished products. First then, through the hoses linking ship with shore, goes the crude oil. And then through the pipes along the jetty. From the jetty, pipes carry the crude inland to the refinery towering against the skyline. Storage tanks are ready to receive the crude. Immense tanks, 150 feet in diameter. Half as wide again as the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. As yet we've seen no oil whatever. And that's normal. For whether in pipes or tanks, or any of the other apparatus of refining, oil must be enclosed. But in the refinery's laboratory, for analysis and tests, it comes out into the open. To all appearances, crude oil is merely a dark liquid. In fact, it's a mixture of many different constituents. And refining may be described, quite simply, as a separation of these constituents from one another. If oil men were magicians, it could be done as simply as this. To the chemist, all these different constituents are merely different arrangements of two familiar elements, carbon and hydrogen. Atoms of carbon, black, and hydrogen, white, join together in groups. Each separate constituent of crude oil has its own characteristic group. Each group is called a hydrocarbon molecule. The nature of any particular constituent of crude oil, its molecular weight and its boiling point, depend very largely on how many carbon atoms there are in its characteristic molecule. So for the moment we can forget the hydrogen atoms and concentrate on the carbon atoms. And now we shall see how, by some strange alchemy, Refining sorts these little fellows into their separate groups. Most of us remember this toy from childhood days. A Chinese puzzle, it was called. Square boxes fitted one inside the other. And we can make these boxes represent the constituents of crude oil by filling each one with carbon atoms. The larger the box is, the greater the number of atoms to each box. The greater the number of atoms, the greater the molecular weight, and so the higher the boiling point. Now, 
the whole set of boxes represents one drop of crude oil. Each box or square representing a different group of constituents. These groups are called fractions. When the crude is heated, the gray square, representing the lighter fractions, is the first to vaporize. As the temperature rises, the yellow fraction, petrol, is the next to vaporize. Then the yellow-green fraction, paraffin or kerosene. Now the green fraction, lubricating oil. The blue-green fraction, fuel oil. We're left with the heaviest fraction, the blue square representing bitumen or asphalt. This does not vaporize. If the temperature is now progressively lowered, each fraction condenses as soon as the temperature drops below that at which it boiled. Since each fraction condenses at a different temperature, the liquids can be drawn off and collected separately. This is the basic theory of distillation. We'll watch how it's done in practice. You recall that the crude oil delivered by ocean tanker was pumped to the storage tanks. From the storage tanks, the crude travels to the distillation plant, where we select one typical fractionating tower. It's here that the process of distillation takes place. In the foreground is the heater, a furnace really, through the heater flows the crude, which you see here is a mixture of many different fractions. Fiercely heated by the furnace, all but the heaviest fractions are rapidly vaporized. The crude has now become a mixture of vapors and heavy liquid. So into the fractionating tower. Here takes place the recovery in liquid form of the various fractions which have passed through the heater. Perhaps it'll look clearer in diagram. The fractionating tower is divided into compartments, one above the other, each maintained at a different temperature, rather like a vertical Turkish bath. The hottest compartment is at the bottom, the coolest at the top. The floor of each compartment forms a tray for collecting the liquid which will condense at the temperature of that particular compartment. To keep things simple, we're showing only a few compartments and only one tray to each. Here enters the partly vaporized crude oil from the heater. The heavy liquid not vaporized in the heater falls to the bottom. The hot vapors begin to rise up the fractionating tower through scores of holes in each tray. Each hole is covered by a bubble cap, a device which forces the rising vapors to pass through the condensed liquid in the tray. In this compartment, you can see the fuel oil vapors condensing and falling back into the tray. The other vapors pass on. And here you see lubricating oil vapor condensing. Now paraffin or kerosene. Only petrol vapor and light gases survive to reach the top compartment. These pass out overhead. Outside the tower, a cooler condenses the petrol vapor into liquid, separating it from the lighter gases. The 
crude oil has now been separated into different fractions, making in this case six streams. But inside the fractionating tower, remember, there are actually many more compartments and an elaborate counterflow system so that the different temperatures virtually blend into one another like this. And the vapors will therefore condense into a range of liquids correspondingly varied. To control the quantity and quality of any one of these streams, we alter the width of what is called the cut within the tower by adjusting the temperature distribution. After further treatment and processing, each stream becomes a useful product. The light gases are used for fuel in the refinery itself to feed the furnaces. As bottled gas for metal cutting. To give us heat to cook by. This is one of the components of petrol. Petrol is chemically treated to remove corrosive elements and then blend it into its familiar grades. And you next find it at filling stations. Paraffin or kerosene is treated in a separate plant. From here you get kerosene for that traditional use for oil, the lamp. Kerosene of another type propels that most up-to-date means of locomotion, jet aircraft. Diesel oil, increasingly used by road transport. Site clearing. Railways. Motor ships. Lubricating oils must go through even more complicated refining processes. Lubricants of many kinds, to keep the wheels of the world spinning smoothly. An interesting byproduct from the refining of lubricating oil is wax, used for the insulation of electric wiring, in waxed paper for wrapping food, and in endless other ways. Fuel oil generates steam, driving the big ships, for instance. It fires furnaces in factories. And the heaviest residue of all, bitumen, surfaces our roads and protects our roofs. So far, we've said nothing about market demand. Straight distillation, the fractionating tower that is, breaks a typical crude oil into these proportions of marketable products. Nature fixed the proportions and distillation alone cannot change them. But the proportions demanded by the market are quite different. Petrol, the yellow section, is the conspicuous example. Now the skill of refining consists in matching supply to demand, meeting all these requirements with nothing left over. So the oil men have added a new phrase to our vocabulary. Fluid catalytic cracking. Here, in what is commonly called the cat cracker, the process of winning more petrol takes place. This tall tower, just a storehouse really, contains a substance essential to the process. Hundreds of tons of white powder. The powder is a catalyst. These particles of catalyst are a law unto themselves. They can change a substance without themselves being changed. When the particles of hot catalyst come into contact with these heavy molecules of oil, they exert their authority and break up the molecules into smaller groups. 
When heated, the molecules tend to break up of their own accord. The catalyst speeds up this cracking process. Some of these molecules are now light enough for petrol. But we must follow this process within the cat cracker itself. This immense plant has three main components. The regenerator, the reactor, and the fractionator. First, in the regenerator, you find the catalyst superheated and continuously on the move. On the move down this pipe to meet the incoming stream of heavy oil, which was one of the surplus products of distillation. Meeting the hot catalyst, the oil is immediately flashed into vapor. Together, catalyst and vaporized oil pass up into the reactor. Inside the reactor, most of the molecules of vaporized heavy oil split up into molecules of gas and petrol vapor, which pass out overhead. The particles of catalyst are flung aside, but will live to fight another day, for that's the nature of a catalyst. You can use it over and over again. True, the process has covered the particles with a coating of carbon, and the coating must be stripped off before the catalyst can resume its work. But this is simple. The catalyst becomes incandescent as it meets a stream of air which blows it along this pipe back into the regenerator. The fresh oxygen allows the carbon coating to burn away, leaving the catalyst cleaned and reheated and ready to do its job over and over again. Such small catalyst losses as take place are made up regularly. Meanwhile, the cat cracker is continuing its main function. Products from the reactor are passing out overhead to the fractionator. There, the petrol, one from the cracking process, is sorted out from the lighter and heavier products, namely gases and fuel oil. So we see the whole cycle of the cat cracker's operation. There is indeed something rather miraculous about the cat cracker. Not merely its uninterrupted flow, but the fact that it transmutes one natural constituent of oil into another. It's given us more petrol than nature ever put there, and more important still, the process has greatly improved its quality. All very fine, you may say, but here, from the outside, nothing seems to be happening. And that, indeed, is one of the oddities of a refinery. Nothing does seem to be happening. Only in the control rooms do you realize that refining has become, in a sense, a push-button industry. A matter of remote control by just a few men of skill and experience, with watchful eyes on the dials and fingers alert at the switches. You remember that the fractionating tower, straight distillation, yielded this amount of petrol. The problem being to meet this demand from the consumers. Cracking has increased the supply of petrol by this amount. We're still this much short. Again, the oil men addressed themselves to the problem. They found the answer in this the further process called polymerization. A catalyst again, but this time of a different kind. Instead of breaking the molecules, it joins together a number of small molecules of the light gases produced by the cat cracker to form a stable liquid. Each of these long cylinders is a reactor filled with this catalyst. The raw material
material for polymerization, the light gases, is fed under pressure into the reactors, and so through the catalyst where the welding process takes place. The products of the reactor go on to the polymer stabilizer, another distillation process. Here the stable liquid is condensed and separated from the gas which has not been polymerized. This liquid is another petrol stock which gives high grade petrol that extra quality. You've seen how three different petrol components are made. By blending together a little of this and a little of that, it's possible to meet the exact specifications required for the various grades of finished product. These are the plants that do the blending. Now let's look at the drums for the last time. Straight distillation produced this much petrol. Cracking added this much. And polymerization has added this much. The output of petrol and indeed that of all products of the refinery is now meeting market demands. Petrol, lubricants, fuel oils, bitumen, bottled gas, jet fuel, diesel oil, the work of a refinery never stops. 24 hours a day, year in, year out. Now that we've been to the center of the maze and back again, we've perhaps learned that an oil refinery is nothing more or less than a prodigious source of energy, providing in a thousand ways power and warmth and convenience for all of us. Domes and tubes and towers, symbols of nature's bounty and the ingenuity of man.